800 years ago, St. Francis of Assisi did something that indirectly heightened liturgical worship beyond what had ever been known before and forever ruined it. He set up a living nativity scene. As a highly emotional, sensual man, he didn't want to simply think about the birth of Jesus. It was not enough to hold the mystery of the Incarnation deep within his heart. He wanted to see it, to feel it, to smell it. He collected farm animals, arranged hay, made the townspeople wear costumes, and even laid a baby in the manger to watch it wriggle and coo, yawn and cry, just as our Lord would have. It must have been a powerful moment for everyone to witness, the sort of thing that transports you from wherever you are to another world. Whatever you were doing, whatever you were thinking about is gone. Now it's as if you were there in that very moment when Christ was born, as if you were there to see him yourself. The liturgies of Holy Week offer us a modern example of this experience. While St. Francis had nothing to do with the practice we have today, you can see the same theological method being employed. We don't simply want to think about the events of Jesus' passion. We want to see them, feel them, immerse ourselves in them as if we were there. On Palm Sunday, we don't simply read about Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. We gather away from the church with palm branches in hand, singing Hosanna, recreating to the best of our ability the actual events of that holy day. On Holy Thursday, we do not simply read about Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. We select 12 members of the community, and the priest lowers himself to wash their feet. On Good Friday, we do not simply read about Jesus' passion on the cross. We carry in a full-size cross to behold and venerate. And on Holy Saturday, we do not simply read about God's power and salvation history to conquer darkness and bring light to the world. We witness it, entering into the church by candlelight and erupting in jubilation when the light is thrown on. For Catholics, liturgy is not an intellectual exercise alone or even primarily. It involves our senses, our imagination, our emotions. We fill it in with colors and symbols and tactile experiences so that what is written on the page may come to life before our eyes, so that we may experience a taste of what has happened in the past. Even in ordinary times, the Mass itself takes the form of the Last Supper, transporting us to the table where Jesus first offered his body and blood as a covenant for all. In a way, what we do in Holy Week, what we do every time we gather in liturgy, is try to capture precisely what St. Francis wanted a taste of the past, a visual representation of what God has done in the world. We leave this world behind to witness another. There's a reason why the liturgy is so important to the church. There's a reason why we call it the source and summit of our lives. It makes present before our eyes the mysteries of the past. But it does more than that. In fact, that's not even primarily what it does. Think about it. If our purpose in gathering was to recreate or participate in the past, to pretend that we were a part of another world, then what's the difference between going to church and watching a movie, entering an immersive VR experience, going to a passion play put on by the local elementary school? They're cool, yes, catechetical, maybe, but ultimately, all of these things are irrelevant to our lives. While I obviously love what St. Francis did and look forward to the immersive aspects of Holy Week and Christmas all year, there is no doubt that such productions routinely confuse the average churchgoer, even priest at times, into thinking that what we do in liturgy is primarily about recreating and reliving the past. The Eucharist is not an elaborate passion play. The priest is not an actor playing the part of Jesus, recreating what has happened for all to see. Rather, when the priest gathers with the people for liturgy, we are not just remembering what happened long ago, we are calling to mind how what happened long ago is still true today, still unfolding today, still bringing life today. Now, it's important to understand exactly what I'm saying here, which means understanding what I am not saying. I am not saying that we are re-sacrificing Christ or participating in a new moment of Calvary each time we attend liturgy. The church has always taught that there is but one sacrifice, the one Jesus offered on Calvary, and every Mass is a participation in that once-for-all historical moment. Because of this, the priest is not just some ordinary guy offering a new prayer each time he celebrates Mass. The priest, as someone properly ordained in the line of Christ, acts in persona Christi, in the person of Christ, so that when he says the words, this is my body and this is my blood, he's not speaking of himself, but through the power of Christ working through him, the bread and wine are transformed into the body and blood of Christ. At the same time, the priest is not Christ himself. He is still an ordinary human being that is not God. When he preaches, he does not do so with the authority or perfection of Christ. When he says the announcements, he is not the voice of God. While he offers the sacrifice of Christ and says Christ's words, he also says many words that are entirely particular to our time 
and our place. Meaning that when we celebrate Mass, we should not approach the priest as if he is the one Christ himself, but he is far more than an actor in a play. The priest is the one who does for the people what Christ did, offers prayer and sacrifice for the present needs of the church to transform the church into his body. He calls to mind the work of God in the past so that we can participate in the work of God in the present. In other words, what Christ did long ago, he continues to do today. And that is what we celebrate. And so, when we attend Mass on Palm Sunday, we are not merely remembering that Jesus walked through Jerusalem to palms and cries of jubilation. We bring our own palms and cry out in jubilation ourselves to remind ourselves that we are called to follow Christ today, that he comes to lead us to salvation today, but comes in unexpected ways and walks us through difficult paths. Our focus is not on pretending that we were there 2,000 years ago. It is on praying for the sight to see him in our lives now and the strength to carry our own crosses today. When we celebrate the Mass of the Last Supper on Thursday night, we are not merely remembering that Jesus washed his disciples' feet and gave them the Eucharist. We recreate these gestures to remind ourselves of our own commitment to humility, that those who receive the self-sacrifice of the Eucharist must go and do likewise for others. Our focus is not on pretending that we were there 2,000 years ago, is on praying for the conversion of heart to be more like Jesus in our humility and sacrifice today. When we gather to remember the Lord's Passion on Good Friday, we are not merely remembering that Jesus gave his life for us and that his disciples were left scattered and devastated. We bring our own tragedies, cry tears for our own heartbreaks to remind ourselves how desperately we need God in this world. Our focus is not on pretending that we were there 2,000 years ago at the cross losing Jesus, it is on praying for consolation for the actual loved ones we have lost today. And we do all of this, and this is the whole point right here. We do all of this so that when we gather for Easter, either at the vigil or at Mass during the day, we can do more than just remember that Jesus rose from the dead long ago and instead celebrate what Jesus is accomplishing for us today. Our own salvation, our own redemption, our own deliverance from death to life. Our focus is not on what Christ did, but on what Christ continues to do today. That is the point of all liturgy. That is why we gather. It's not about recreating or remembering past events. It's not a passion play or Christmas pageant. It's about bringing our own weaknesses, our own sorrows, our own desperate need for life to God so that he can raise us up today just as he raised up his son before. We remember and participate in the historic events of Christ's life so that what he experienced long ago may come to fulfillment in our lives today. Meaning we must do two very important things. First, we must come to Mass prepared. Because Mass is not a play, it is not something that we simply consume. We offer our own prayers and sacrifices. In order to participate in what Christ is offering us, we must offer our very selves, our hopes, our sorrows, our weaknesses, our joys, and our wills. When it comes to liturgy, you get out what you put in, so offer your entire self as a living sacrifice. And this does not cease when we leave the church, it simply begins. If we want the Paschal mystery to be brought to fulfillment in our lives, if we want the Mass to have any significance at all to us, we must do more than just attend the Mass, we must live it. We must see the Mass not as some extrinsic, otherworldly experience, but as a continuation and affirmation of the way that we live with humility, depending on God, seeking his face in ordinary elements, admitting our faults, reconciling with others, and begging for charity and justice. If the things that we do in Mass have no place in our regular lives, if the only time that we do these things is once a week for an hour in church, the Mass will have very little meaning to us. It is only when the sacrifice we receive at Mass leads us to what we do in the world, and what we do in the world leads us to offer our lives as sacrifice at Mass, that the Paschal mystery will be more than just some past event. When the two become one, when we begin to live what we pray, not as recreations of past events, but as assertions of what Christ has and continues to do for us in the present, the Mass will begin to make sense. We are not actors in a play, and we are not trying to relive the past. Our goal in the liturgy, as in life, is to participate in what Christ is doing today. Paschal mystery is not that Jesus rose from the dead, it is that he is alive today. 